Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. Today we're talking with Larry Williams Jr., freelance location sound mixer based out of South Florida. So welcome, Larry. Hey, Michael. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Now, we always like to jump right in and ask, what's in your audio bag? Just a rundown (laughs) from mics to mixer to power distribution and everything in between. Sure. In my bag, the base of the of the rig is a, is a sound device, a 633. Really, really love this mixer recorder. Uh, I, I love it because of the, uh, it's small, compact, but I can get up to six inputs in there, which is fantastic. So when I need to go big, I can. But for the most part, you know, I'm, I'm usually rocking just a couple of uh, receivers. Uh, receivers and transmitters wise, I've got uh, Electrosonics, I've got an SR. See one of the the new ones, which I'm really really happy about. It's an A1 band, so it's wide band. So I'm rocking 470, uh, block 19 and block 20, and I got to tell you, it's just been really really nice having the the flexibility to, you know, scan and whoop that one's full, not a problem. I just jump to the next block, and uh, I, you know, Electrosonics they did a really really nice job with this one, and uh, I, I have more confidence when I'm out there, you know, checking and scanning, and uh, it works great. So it, it, it's cool because you know I grew up in this industry with, you know, electrosonics and sound devices is what I knew. And right next to that, uh, I've got a Electro UCR 205D Block 28. Shh, don't tell anybody. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, and it still kicks butt, man, I gotta tell you. So so for the most part, I'm rocking, you know, three wireless and, and a boom, and that covers, I wanna say 95% of, of what I end up doing. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy with, with the setup. Uh, in terms of BDS, I used to be a remote audio guy. Uh, but now I've got uh, an audio root uh, BDS here, and it, it's great. It's it's uh, it's the Mark II. It's the B, uh, the the BDGU. Uh, everyone's gonna get at me for that one. But uh, it's it's the it's the, it's the Mark II with the with the two channels, and I get a full readout with the smart battery, with the percentage, the hours remaining, the voltage, uh, amps, watts, all that good stuff. And it just uh, I'm, I always know how much I'm drawing, how much I'm pulling. And, and these batteries last a long time. They're 98 watt hours. So, you know, I went from, you know, the, the MP1s, which I used for years. And then when I made the jump to this, it just literally a whole battery will last me the whole day for the most part. You know, you get your occasional gigs where you're rolling and running and gunning where, you know, I may have to switch batteries uh, maybe three quarters uh, through the day. But for the most part, I've, I've never, you know, burned two of these batteries, you know, in, in the course of one day. So. But yeah, so on sound devices, electrosonics, audio root, and, and I'm also, uh, um, in terms of time code, I've got a, a tentacle sync, one of the classic models, and it gets the job done for me, man. So to me, it's like, you know, I've, I've found my niche in, you know, three wireless, a six channel mixer recorder uh, with a tentacle sync. And like I said, it covers 98% of what I end up doing. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, I've, I've got a couple of tentacle sync boxes as well, the classic models. Um, I saw the guys out in, I was out at NAB this year, and okay. I stopped by their booth. And the new ones, you know, with the Bluetooth, yeah. um, they, they're pretty fancy too. And, yeah. and also, apparently, with the new uh, Bluetooth updates, I guess, you can actually, because it, it's, it's seeing the time code Bluetooth, it'll actually record time code on your phone. So if you recorded oh. some video clips... Uh, from what I understood, it was like, yeah, so that can sync up later in, you know, if you had some little behind the scenes footage. So Right, right, right. right. Well, the other thing, too, is, you know, they've got a, a watch app also. So if you're if you're an iPhone guy out there and you've got an Apple watch, you know, I saw that they've got uh, there's an app and you can literally just peek down at your at your watch and check the time code of, you know, of, of your tentacles and just make sure everything is in sync and, and, and working great. So they really tried to open it up to you know make it easier to check, you know, see what you got going on. So uh, I, I'm hoping I'll upgrade to, to one of those newer models at some point when the time is right, but uh, they made a great generation one product and I'm gonna rock it till, uh, till I absolutely can't anymore. <laughs> 
Exactly. Actually, I stopped by the booth and I was I had I had a couple and I wanted one more uh, when I was out there and they were like, well, you know, we don't really sell those anymore. And they dug uh, around underneath and no. they found one. <laughs> and I was just like, yes, because <laughs> I, I looked everywhere, you know. That's so. cool. That's great. Yeah, they, they, they phased them out pretty quick. It was uh, there was a big rush. And then all of a sudden you can't get them anywhere. Everything is Every, it's an e-world now, so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, what are some of the main audio gigs you do? Um, a lot of the things I do down here are, uh, I, I do some TV stuff, uh, some corporate stuff. For me, it, it, it's, you know, some news, sports. So um, for me, it, it's fun because I, I literally get to do something different every day. You know, even product, you know, marketing videos, commercial stuff. So um, working at the production company I worked at for 10 years exposed me to a lot of different genres because it just, you know, we'd get the call and it was, OK, we're, you know, we're going to record a commercial for this product or OK, we're off, you know, on location here recording uh, with engineers as they talk about these cool engines that they are, they're coming out for these boats or these ATVs or whatever. So, you know, for me, it, it's been great because I haven't just gotten kind of sucked into one genre in particular. And for me, that, that's been fun because I'm one of those guys, I'm always looking to learn. I'm always looking to try and get better. And so, you know, when I can do these different projects and things, it, it I don't know, it just keeps me stimulated. It just keeps me motivated just to keep going. And I meet different people when I'm out on, you know, set and on location. And uh, I've enjoyed it, man. It's, it's been really cool. So just the diversity of what I get uh, keeps me going. That's great. What was the most interesting project you've done? You know, it, it's funny because, you know, I was thinking the other day that for me, it's like I've, I've worked on a number of different ones. But, you know, probably the coolest one for me, and, and it happened actually, you know, recently. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the, the Red Bull World Run. It's a world race, which is basically there are countries all over the world where there's a race that happens simultaneously. So everyone is either walking, running, uh, rolling in a wheelchair, you know, whatever. And I got to ride in the lead vehicle for this particular race down here in Florida. So in Miami, uh, they actually had it in Sunrise, which is a, a suburb you know, out west. And uh, I got to ride in the, the lead truck and we were you know, basically in, in front of the whole pack. And so the gentleman that ended up winning, his name was Aaron Anderson. And uh, he is, uh, uh, he's in a wheelchair. And uh, this gentleman ended up winning the entire race of everyone in the entire world. He literally rolled 55 miles from Sunrise, Florida, up uh, US 27. And uh, so we were just the truck in front of him. And so we would do these interviews with him, um, you know, during the race. And, and uh, he, you know, he was just, it was such a, a cool project to be a part of because for me, it's, it's you, know, you know, working the technical aspect of what we do is cool and, and recording, but the people we get to meet and the things that we get to do, you know, in our line of work is, is, is what's very cool. So that project there, it really stands out because, you know, at the end of it all, like, you know, we were literally feet away from the gentleman who, beat everyone in the whole world with this particular event. So uh, it's something I'll never forget. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's something about, I don't know if you find the same, but it's like 90% of what we do, you know, it's the bread and butter, gets the bills right. paid, and it's that right. 10% that says, that's why we do this. Exactly, do this. exactly. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. What would you say your worst on-set experience is? And you don't have to use, <laughs> you don't have to use names or anything, but if you've got some like horror story, that'd be it. Great. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, and I, I don't I, I don't even mind sharing the name of this one. Um, it wasn't a horrible unsaid experience. It was more embarrassing for me. Um, uh, it was with uh, Jack Nicholas, uh, the Golden Bear. And uh, uh, it was one of the opportunities I got to work with him. And uh, one, actually one of the first times I got to work with him. And, you know, I, I, you know, just doing my normal thing and walked up to him, introduced myself. Mr. Nicholas, it's nice to meet you. Um, I've got a microphone. I'm going to uh, mic you up. And if it's OK, I just want to, uh, you know, clip this mic to your polo shirt. The whole room went silent. <laughs> Mr. Nicholas went silent. And he looks up at me and he says, uh, <laughs> he says, son, it's kind of hard to swing a golf club in a polo shirt. And, uh, and then the whole room kind of started chuckling and laughing. And then I smiled and laughed and he smiled and laughed. And uh, it was just one of those moments like, you don't walk up to one of the greatest, if not the greatest golfers in the history of the sport and tell him he's wearing a polo shirt. So uh, <laughs> so I'll never forget that. So, But I mean, after that, he, he was fine. And he, he joked with me uh, kind of the rest of the job of, you know, about the, 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 the polo line. And uh, I've worked with him a couple of times since then, and I've reminded him of it, and uh, we still get a laugh out of it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, I actually uh, had a chance to work with Arnold Palmer one time, 
and a nice guy, just kind and friendly. I actually was working on, I was getting the kit set up and he came out of this little cottage and he, he was like, I mean, I was the only one there. And he was like, hey, how are you? I mean, he didn't have to respond or say anything. Nobody else was around. And that was like a lasting impression. But he didn't want me to put a mic on him. And ah. so we had to like, we had to like boom him. We tried our best. And, but it was, uh, it was one of the last, um, you know, Arnold Palmer invitationals, you know, that went on. So, but ni- nice guy. That was like my brief moment with, with Arnold. So. Oh man. Uh, rest in peace, Arnold Palmer. So I've heard nothing but great things about him also. Uh, I enjoy drinking the beverage named in his honor, uh, quite frequently, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. When, whenever I can. <laughs> It's interesting. I was going to ask you, too, you know, um, I mean, you know, it's occasionally I'll, I'll get that where, you know, the person doesn't want to be loved or you'll I'll have someone who insists on kind of doing it themselves. I, I just, you know, I'm, I know this is your podcast, but I'm always curious to when I talk to other guys, how do you handle situations like that where it's, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be boomed or it's like, OK, the love, give it to me. I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, you know, everyone's been pretty good. I mean, I was like, well, you know, we really need to get the best audio. And I just try to, you know, tell them that. And then booming is usually we would just have to go to that. And so it just, you know, we we try. So and depending on the camera shot, you know, too, if it's a wide shot, you're like, oh, what are we going to do here? Right. So, you know, usually if you're in, in talking with the rest of the crew or something, somebody usually gets but I haven't had it too much, but okay. just, actually his was one of the main ones that, that he didn't want it. So Interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. Did you ever forget any equipment on your way to the set and then like, oh my gosh. I will say this, that like once upon a time, I actually did forget, uh, I forgot my boom pole. Like I, I was rushing out of, uh, out of the, the garage one morning and I, you know, I, I, it just slipped my mind and I show up and I almost just lost it uh when i showed up but fortunately the 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 camera guy who i was working with he actually had one he's one of these guys who's got you know old ultra uber backups uh in his uh in his in in his truck and so i ended up using his pole that day with one of my mics um and it uh it worked out okay you know fortunately it was just a corporate deal that day but uh so it wasn't a huge deal but it was just one of those like once it happens once it's like it's something i've never forgotten it since then it was just one of those where like you know, it was, I, I didn't quite had everything laid out in front of me like I normally do the night before. And uh, so that's why, I, you know, it's funny you say this. Like, I'm all about routines, man. So now it's like when I get home from a job, it's I, I kind of deconstruct the bag in a way. So that way I have to construct it when I get to the next location. So the antennas come off, um, you know, I'll, I'll put batteries on charge and then I'll go ahead and I'll put uh, one of the audio root batteries, you know, in the bag so that I'm ready to go for the next day and just trying to minimize the confusion. And so that way it's just a reset every day. So it's, you know, that would be my biggest thing to recommend to everybody is just have that routine. So that way you'll know if something's out of order. And then if it is out of order, you can, you know, address it, you know, right away. Oh, that's great advice. Yeah, I have, a, I have an awful story where <laughs> I, I was packing up the gear and I, was, and I was just trying to, you know, be prepared for any possible situation. So I'm like, OK, but, mm-hmm. you know, they didn't really say they wanted this and that. And I had some headphones laid out and I had I was like, OK, uh, you know, which one am I going to bring? Well, I'm driving to the gig and I'm, I'm going over my head. OK, we got this, we got this, we got this. And all of a sudden I went, oh, oh they, you know, they didn't want headphones. I'm like, I didn't pack the headphones. Oh. And I'm like, what? I mean, that is the most critical oh. piece of equipment that we need. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm going, I, I won't be able to go, go back home and pick oh it up and make it on time. And I'm like, right. what are my options? So I'm racing down the highway and I'm going, okay, music stores, uh, Best uh-huh. Buy, what, are, what, what can I do? So I, I end up going, okay, Best Buy. So let's let's just route. So I, it, I routed. It was kind of out of the way, but I... Mm-hmm. I went racing in there and I go in and they don't have any, they're, most of their headphones are, you know, they're all wireless now and they're all oh. noise canceling and they all have to be charged before you use them. Oh and I'm my like, God. I can't even find a quick backup and I'm going, I can't go in with earbuds because you right. you'll never get that. You'll never get another job again doing <laughs> that. And so finally I found this little pair of Sony's and it, they were, they were wired and you could pop in a battery for, you know, for noise, you know, noise canceling if you wanted. Sure. But I was like, oh my gosh. So that was like, that was when I came up with, you know, I got my checklist and I just, I go down the checklist and it's never going to happen again. Like you said, it happens once and you never do you it again. Never, oh man. Yeah. It, it's uh yeah, it's one of those, it, it just leaves a pit in your stomach, right? It's, it's, uh, 
it, I, it's like all I needed is is one time, and then uh, it, it won't happen again. I mean, you, you, you try not to. So I mean, that's why it's like you know, I'm sure like you now, it's like I've got two pairs of headphones. So if 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 one fails, I've I've got a I've got an older you know um, I use the the Ultrasones, the the HF5 580s, and uh, okay. I love them. And um, so for my backups, I've got a an older pair of. Uh, uh, Sony MDR 7506s, which are great for backups. I mean, I, I mixed with them for, for years until recently. And so they became uh, uh, my backups. And so it's, you know, a lot of times I'll, you know, if I'm, if I, if my bag is, you know, if I'm away from the cameras and so what I'll do is I'll take the, you know, those 7506s and I'll go over to each camera and just kind of plug in and listen and make sure, you know, everything is sounding good, for, particularly for instances where, I, where I'm sending, you know, audio direct to camera. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just a great pair of headphones that they have around. So, but yeah, it's just, you know, you know, between that and hardwired lives and, you know, there's, there's a million things that you want to, you know, kind of have in your kit, you know, just as a, as a backup in case, uh, in case it comes to that, you know, because sometimes you may, you may get into a scenario where, you know, the, the frequencies are all jammed or all logged or you have a malfunction and well, we can still do the interview. I've got an old school hardwired live. It's older than me, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, actually, when it comes to gear, do you, uh, from your experience, would you recommend renting the gear or buying gear? Renting versus buying is a is a really great uh, question. For me, the gear that I have right now, um, I, I bought it all. So, you know, the the one thing I will say in the world of production that um, as sound guys, I feel like we we have an advantage over the camera department, um, just because a, a well maintained sound bag will last years. You know, we're not having to go buy a new camera body every, you know, two or three years. So if you get a right kit, it'll last a while. Now, I will say that there are certain things that maybe you don't need to buy that maybe are worth renting. And so sometimes it may be, you know, a second or a third, you know, a time code jam box. If you got a multi-camera thing, at least that's what I do now. So I've got one dedicated a technical sync that I have and, and I use that. And so, but for my, you know, two or three camera jobs, I'll go rent one. Sometimes Comtech's the same way, you know, it's like, you know, the, a lot of the jobs I have, they don't even require, they don't care about Comtech, but for the ones that do, I'll go rent it. Uh, if maybe I need a fourth or a fifth wireless mic, I'll go rent that. Now, if I, you know, if you get on something that's maybe a little longer term and it, you know, all comes to economics, if, you know, you get on something where it's, you know, a four week run or some nice six week run that you're on and it makes sense for you to just go ahead and invest in that equipment and let that job pay for it, then then you make that move and, and buy it. So you just got to, you have to evaluate your situation differently. So to me, it's like, if you have a basic kit, a couple of wireless lobs, you know, you got a couple of shotguns, uh, mixer, recorder, you you know, that'll cover, you know, 95% of, of the jobs out there. And, um, and then when it's time for you to kind of, you know, scale up for something a little bit bigger, go rent, man, save that money. Because, I mean, we can easily spend, you know, on the low end, maybe five grand to 10 grand. I mean, it's, it's a lot of investment going on here. Right. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. 10, 15, you know, depending on, on what you do. But like I said, it, you know, to me, it's, it's, you know, if I can get something that will last me a while. And that's why, you know, you also want to invest in what you invest in. You know, like I've got sound devices and electrosonics. And, you know, like I said, I literally grew up, you know, with these brands. And so for me, you know, I, I know that they're going to work, you know, and if they don't work, these brands are so, so renowned that they take care of their customers, you know, whether it be, you know, on Facebook or whatever, you know, you can get with Gordon Moore anytime, you know, he'll respond to a post and they take care of you, man. So it's like, you know, take your, you know, do your due diligence, you know, invest in, you know, the brands that, that, you know, that aren't just quality, but offer great customer service too, because things do break, you know, things do go bump in the night and when they do, you want to make sure you've got a, uh, you know, you know there's, there's a mothership that you can send it to, to, uh, to get it uh, rehabbed. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good advice. You know, buy once, cry once. And then you have the other guys that when you buy a bunch of like cheap stuff, you buy a lot and cry a lot. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so it, it, so it's, bite the bullet the first time and get something that's going to be decent. Exactly. 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 You know, it's funny. Like I, I weighed uh, for a little while before I got my 633, you know, uh, the, the Zoom, the F8. You know, it was the talk of the town. And it was like, I don't need to spend, you know, $2,000 or $3,000 on a recorder mixer. I can do this. And for those that have that mixer, it, it's great and for, for what, you know, for what they want. But for me personally, I just wanted to make that investment one time because, you know, everything has its limitations. And so with that in mind, you want to make sure that whatever you get, you know, 
it, it, it's going to last and you're going to be able to have a, a great shorthand with it that you're not struggling or fumbling around. And, and you know, the couple of times I used the, the Zoom, it, I just I didn't develop that shorthand with it that I had with the with the sound devices. You know, my very first mixer was a, a 442. Uh, sound device is 442 okay. and then it was uh, and then it was a 302 we kind of alternated back and forth with that and then came the 633 so yeah, I'm a sound devices guy you know I, I that's what I am so you know I, I used uh, a nomad a couple of times and I just it, it just wasn't as intuitive to me as as the sound devices so oh, that's good yeah I, I picked up the sound devices mix pre 10t and I oh. and I have really been kind of trying to see if I can make it you know, be a, a good quality field recorder. You know, it's got, you know, onboard time code and it's got eight XLR inputs and then it's got 3.5 millimeter jack for additional. But so far, you know, it, it's been working pretty good. Plus you can use the, the Wingman app with it and right. it's kind of native so you don't have to have a... And then also it has the little mini USB, the micro USB little backup drive I can plug in. And after the end of every take, it backs up right to the to the nice. little card. So, so nice. I've been trying to see, it's like, can I make this, you know, work in the field real well? And I, I looked at sound devices for years. Sure. And, and I, I read every article and watched every video just because I'm like, you know, these guys are good. And then I ran into them at, uh, I was out at Podcast Movement last year, and they were marketing their Mix Pre 6, you know, to podcasters. I also have a, a Sony A7S II camera, and he said you can, you know, couple that, and when you hit record on the camera, the Mix Pre 6 goes into record as well. You know, through oh, wow. its, um, it has like a, a HDMI time code, so it'll like trigger it. So I, gotcha. I was like, so I reviewed that last year, and you know, wanted to see. I'm like, you know, I, I kind of like this. And then <laughs> they came out with the Mix Pre 10T with the time code. And I'm thinking, you know what? That's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> So anyway, so I, I I jumped on the bandwagon with that just to see, and so far it's been going pretty good. So nice, nice. Hey, when when, when you find the one that that's right for you, man, it's it's a good feeling because you you go to every job super confident, you know, knowing that you can overcome, uh, you know, if something does come up, you can overcome it because you know how to work it, you know. So exactly. yeah, that's that's, that, that's very very cool, very cool. Do you find a lot of your clients still prefer to go direct to camera? Or are they you know comfortable using second system sound? Great question. I'll start off by saying that when I came up, there was no recorders when, you know, when I started, obviously. Um, and so everything was straight to camera. So straight to a beta cam, straight to an HDX 900, straight to whatever. And, and you mix to stereos and that was it. Um, so that's why. So for me, I've gotten used to, you know, sending the camera. So for the most part now, you know, obviously, if, if you get like, a, you know, like an A7S or you get like a 5D, you know, kind of shoot. Um, there, everyone is is now used to the the second recording, and and they just mix it up later in post, and and the camera guys love it because they can move around untethered, particularly for the run and gun stuff. Um, now for you know for like sit down interviews, I will say this though that like for sit down interviews, um, I am still old school, and I'll you know I'll plug into to a camera, and I'll listen to return. You know that's just how I came up. So um, there are certain instances where it makes sense to do that and other times where it's just not practical. You know, maybe I'll throw on, you know, like maybe like a Sennheiser G3 or something as a hop and just for reference. And then um, you jam your time code and boom, you let it go. It is what it is. But, uh, you know, like for, for like for the DSLRs, for example, you know, I'll go in and I'll manually set the uh, set the time code. And it's a point of pride for me when I'm able to manually jam it where it's really really close to you know you know we're talking milliseconds off uh you know to to my bag and and then you know they've got time code that way too a lot of people you know they just they forget about that that element it's like you know what now let, let, if we're going to do it let's do it my time code here on my bag your time code on your camera just trying to help make it easier for for post and you know when it comes to redundancy you know it, it's helpful so that's why i will sometimes send you know, audio direct to camera while recording separately, just so that redundancy is there. If something fails in the camera or something happens with the file being imported, whatever, at least they can bring in the audio from, from my bag, you know, if they so want it. So, you know, like I said, it just depends on the situation, but I, I, I'm still not opposed to sending direct to camera when it's appropriate. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I just had a client recently and they wanted to go direct to camera. Of course, I recorded, you know, in my bag as well. And then sure. at the end, I just, I just pop out that USB and hand it to them and they're able to download the files. And so they had their backup. I had my backup. So nice. It, nice. It, was, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny talk, just even talking about recording and, and, and backups. Um, I wanted to ask you, are you, um, 
you know, how long do you archive for? So, you know, you've done a job, you've recorded it, and, you know, you've got, you know, obviously hard drives cost money, but uh, how often or how long will you hold, you know, a backup after a job for a client? You know, probably, gosh, what, five years? What would be a good, I don't even know what's a good amount. Um, but yeah, well, like you said, once again, you start filling up hard drives. And you're like, how long do I keep this? Sometimes, you know, call the client and say, hey, you know, I've got this old backup. Do you mind if I go ahead and dump it? You know, right, something right. like that. No, I was just going to say, I, I have gotten that call, you know, two months after a job, three months after a job. Hey, we, uh, we, uh, we can't find the audio. The, the editor, the assistant editor, somebody messed up. Do you have uh. the audio still? Actually, yeah, actually, I do still have that. And it's... And it's been nice to be, you know, the hero when it comes to that many times. So, um, you know, so, that, so there is something to be said about archiving it. But I think, you know, like you said, there, there has to be a practical cutoff time, whether it's, you know, six months. You know, if you have this, I guess my rule of thumb is if I have this space, I'm going to do I'm not going to buy additional hard drives to to make room for something that that someone is not paying me for anyway. But I figure it's uh, it's good customer service and. I don't know. It, it, it kind of helps with the reputation, too. Right. It's it's you're the guy who helps save the day. You're the guy who is meticulous enough to keep something for, for that just in case. You know, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's a good feeling to me to be able to help out when I can like that. It's great to, to kind of be the hero in those situations. Cause, <laughs> yeah, I've had a few like, yeah, we uh, accidentally deleted all the audio. And you're like, yeah, I've got a backup. We'll take care of you. Right. We'll take care of you. Exactly. Exactly. Do you usually jam sync from your mixer and let that be the master? Yes, yes. Uh, I jam sync from my mixer. Um, uh, I let that that be the hero. Um, I think there's only one instance uh, ever where I had to to get time code from uh, from someone else or from a camera or something. And I'm trying to remember the specific example, but uh, for the most part, for me, it's like audio is you know audio time code is is the master and everyone else shall follow, <laughs> yes. you know, because it's, you know, it's, it's time code is, you know, we, we need it for that. So the camera guys don't really care. So, um, but yeah, they, as long as it's jammed and it's in sync, it, it works. Yeah. And sound devices is known. They've got, I guess their internal is, is an ambient time code, uh, generator. And so they're, they're pretty popular and, and they're known to, you know, be very accurate. And so that's always a plus. So. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's funny, too, you know, just talking about time code, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the, you know, when it comes to the different camera systems, too, it's always fun to kind of uh, just to kind of see, you know, you know, like, for example, for me, like, I find that the Sony's are really, really good when it comes to, to holding time code. So, you know, if, if it's a situation where I had to jam and, um, you know, and I wasn't able to, you know, kind of stay, you know, plugged into to that time code slot. The, I find that the Sony's hold it so much better than than the Canons, for example. You know, a, a Canon C300, for example, in you know, in my experience, the moment you unplug that time code input from it, it it drifts like immediately. So, um, so that's why it's like if you're working with, you know, C300 guys, just you know, you know, make sure you can leave a time code box on there as much as possible because if you you know, set it and think you can forget it, um, you will be sorry. Because uh, it, it happened to me uh, one of the first times I worked with it. Uh, for whatever reason, we weren't able to keep the time code, you know, you know, connected. And um, uh, it just, you know, there was a there was a drift issue. But uh, I mean, it worked out fine because there was reference audio. But uh, but yeah, it's just, you know, as much as you can, you know, keep 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 a source plugged in. Yeah. You know, actually, we were recording. Uh, we were using a Sony FS 700. And but they were recording to a convergent design Odyssey because it was it does 4K 10 bit video. And I had my tentacle sync time cut on there and something happened during the day. Yeah, it was almost like it, it came, you know, the little B and C got t turned a little bit. Right. But the time code was some crazy number. And I'm thinking, where did that come from? And it, and it was almost like going in slow motion. So I'm like, what is that? Oh, wow. So, Little weird stuff like that happens, so it's always good to check. And apparently, with the with the new Tentacle Sync, you can see on your app it'll show you if one is unplugged or there's a problem. So you can actually, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you're, so, you're, you're selling me, and I'm sure you're selling a lot of other people too on that. But I mean, that's that's yeah. that's really convenient, you know. Uh, you know, it's fun, it's funny, like you're talking about devices and stuff, and you know, it's funny looking at Instagram and looking at you know guys on set, and you know, just the amount of apps and things that have been created that help make location sound that much easier, right? So whether it be like the Wingman app, or uh, you know, obviously the Tentacle app um, for the Electrosonics people out there, you've got the Electro RM app. 
Um, there's the uh, the Freak Finder app for helping to kind of coordinate frequencies. So um, I, I think we're living in a really cool digital kind of age for we have our eye devices with us all the time. And, you know, it's nice to be able to kind of, you know, use them as a tool, you know. And even for me, frankly, I, I don't own a traditional smart slate. Um, that's one of the things that that we were talking about renting versus buying gear. That's another one of the things that like I would I would rent um, unless you know I was on something very specific. But uh, I end up using the the Movie Slate app uh, with the uh, with the time code plugin, and you know I jam that from my bag, and it it's been great. Uh, I've gotten really great feedback on it, and I know some people may say, "Oh, come on, you can't use the iPad for that," but. For the things that I do, it works great and, you know, it holds the time code and, you know, I, I find myself just, you know, jamming it, you know, frequently or, you know, before I take, I'll, I'll jam it and, you know, we'll do a few takes and then, you know, if we you know move on to another scene, you know, I'll jam it again and, you know, I just find myself just, you know, you, you keep it jammed for, you know, to, to, to make sure that, that you're that you're in sync. But, you know, in terms of drift, it uh, it, it has been really, really good to me and, um, you know, able to go in and customize, you know, whatever the, the, uh, the production is on the slate and, uh, whether it be the logo or a picture of the production in progress. And, you know, a lot of people love that, too. So it's just it's a, it's a cool little element. Sixteen hundred dollars for like a, a smart slate versus, uh, you know, the iPad that I have. And, you know, I just buy the, you know, the, that app and the plug in. And uh, it's been good. I've had used it for a number of years now. Isn't it? A, it's, like, it's like a couple hundred dollars iPad app, right? When it, to, well, to enable the, the time code. Right. Well, and it's interesting, too, because before iOS 11, you know, the older version, which was Movie Slate 7, I believe it was uh, $29. And then it was a uh, no, it wasn't $29. I think it was free. And then you ended up paying for whatever plugin you wanted. So I got the, you know, the time code audio plugin. So for I paid you know, 50 bucks like five years ago. And so. Uh, I'm just going to leave this iPad at iOS 10. <laughs> and, exactly. you know, w w when the time comes to go to iOS 11, you know, maybe we'll make that jump. But, I mean, I understand they needed to to, to change their, their model and, and, you know, make it a subscription-based thing. But for me, like, you know, it, it's great. And so I've got, you know, like an older, you know, iPhone 2 that's running uh, iOS 10. So certain jobs where I just need a, a smaller slate, you know, I have it on the phone. And it's like, it's just something that can slip in really quickly and it gets the job done for, for what it is now. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's hard to see it outside and I'm not saying that it's a perfect thing by, by any means, but uh, like I said, for, for the majority of, of what I do and the opportunities where I use it, it works great. So you, that's why you just got to find what works best for you. That's true. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I was I was looking at actually looking at the movie Slate and, and it actually flashes what like a, a frame or two of, of other information too as it's as it's slating, right? So you can uh, actually put some, I think it, you can put some other information in there and it'll flash and it's just, a, and then a video editor could go back and see very specific information about the shots and things like right. that. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you can go, I mean, you can get really deep with it. Um, I, for, I mean, fortunately I haven't had to, it's just been a matter of, you know, filling in, you know, whatever frame rate we're shooting at and, you know, the, the information on the production. But, you know, in terms of XML, I mean, you can go in, you can set it where it'll record whatever the file name was. And then that way you've got this great XML at the end of the job that can be given to the editor. And all of that stuff is, it's all, you know, linked up and synced up and it makes their job uh, even easier. So, yeah, so you can get pretty in depth with it. Um, you know, it, it's got a lot of things under the hood that they've been improving to, to make it be a pretty robust tool for people like us and, you know, who who don't really, you know, have the need to spend on, on the smart slate necessarily, but it's a great all in one kind of thing if when done the right way. That's good. Yeah. Are there any specific expendables that you like to use on a regular basis? Man, I am. Uh, I'm big on the, the right code stickies, man. I, I, I love them. So the right code stickies, you know, it's funny, like on set, you know, I'll, I've gotten kind of They'll, they'll know that Larry was there because of the, the sound man droppings, meaning the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> sticky thick that sometimes get, get left all over the place. Um, but uh, but I love them. They're, they're great because, um, you know, and, and I usually use them with, you know, I've, I've got some sank and some COS 11 Ds. And so with the uh, the rubber mount, the, the RM11, I'll put, you know, a sank in one of those and then I'll just use the um, uh, a sticky and, you know, I can affix it to to a shirt or whatever. And and it's great. It's, you know, the audio is clean. And sometimes depending on what it is, I'll, I'll you know, I'll kind of push that COS 11D up through the 
the RM11 a little further and I'll throw like a windscreen on it or whatever just to kind of help isolate the capsule some more and give it some some protection so um, I've had success with that uh, also now obviously sometimes depending on the, the fabric or what they're wearing um, it's not practical to put it on their on their shirt and I'll just have to go you know you put it directly on the person's chest or whatever and and uh, and, and it works great so I'm all in on the right coat stickies um, additionally I've got some of the right coat over covers for for wind which are fantastic and I use the it, it's the next care it's the next care kind of a medical tape, which is um, it's kind of like flesh colored. And so I'll use that sometimes to to adhere as well. Um, and if I've got a really windy situation, what I'll do is I've got a, some micro dead cat. So I'll put one of those over the sinking head, use a, a thin piece of that next care tape, get it around, you know, the head. And then I'll use a uh, one of the right coat stickies to still adhere it to the person, you know, as well. So everyone has different techniques and different things. So far, these have worked for me and helping to cut down on that, on that wind, particularly outside. And, uh, you know, when you're just trying to get those, you know, mics in there so that you're not, uh, people don't want to see mics, you know what I mean? Which is, which is funny to me. It's, we want good sound, but we don't want to see the mic. Well, sometimes that's not, that's not mutually exclusive. So <laughs> exactly. it, it all depends. You know, what was, I was watching something uh, on Netflix. It was N Narcos. I don't know if you ever watched that show. No, um, I've, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it yet though. But there was a scene where they were kind of shooting the actor from the side and his shirt was kind of open and there was a white mic <laughs> cable and everything. I was like, hey, oh, my gosh, you could see Whoops. it in the shot. And I was like, right. It tucked, you know, up, you know, right, right. Up under his skin. I'm like, man. Oh, that's funny. So, yeah. We try our best to hide them, you know. And it's, we try our best to hide them. Right. Right. You know, it's funny, man. It, it's, it's like, you know, you talk about miking and techniques and stuff. I remember for when I first started, like I didn't really. You know, I, I was kind of the, the the knucklehead who, you know, when it, you know, I, I hated putting a mic in the tie. I just, uh, it just, it bothered me. I, I didn't really enjoy it. It, it wasn't fun. Um, but then, you know, so what I would end up doing is, you know, I put the, you know, put the mic in the tie and then I'm running it down the guy's shirt. And then it just, you know, I, I was stumbling all over myself. And then, and then one day I ended up, I was on set with another sound guy and, and, uh, and he used the technique of just, you know, it was so simple and like my jaw dropped and I was like, well, of course. So, you know, it's just simple. You're, so now micing with ties is like, I do it all the time and, and it's super fast. And so I literally just drop it in the knot of the tie, let it kind of stick out just a little bit and then you tuck it back up. And then I just literally run that wire up and under around the collar. And then uh, so sometimes I'll use like another kind of clip to kind of clip the wire to the back of the guy's collar and then just drop it straight down. Boom, done, you know? Yeah, it's it, it, it just seems like the most natural thing in the world. But, you know, seven, eight years ago doing this stuff, I didn't really, it was just the most... I, I dreaded it. Anytime I saw a guy with a tie, can we bury the mic in the tie? Oh, do we really have yeah. to? But now it's like, <laughs> it's, it's no big deal. And so, and that's just experience, right? It's like, I'm sure you've got, you know, your techniques that you've just kind of honed over the years that are, uh, that are just, you know, it's like second nature to you now, but maybe starting out, it was, it was something that just wasn't, wasn't very easy. Yeah. We were on set recently too. And I, I, I did, we had the Sankin little cost 11 D and I had it up over the top of the, you know, the, and then down through the bottom of the knot and then had it just peeking out just a hint and then sure. push it right up in there. Right. And because they're, they're omnidirectional, I mean, it, it was good audio and it was the video guy that was with me goes, I've never seen anybody do that before. And I was like, yeah, this is a great way to do it, man. <laughs> right. Right. Now that's a great way to do it. And it just, it just seems, you know, like I said, now that we've been doing that for years, it's like, it just, it's the most natural thing in the world. It's like, of course, you know, and that's just over time, just, you know, messing up and doing it. I think I remember the very, very first, and this is something I'll never forget. was like, I think the very, very first time I tried to hide a mic in a tie, uh, I, I literally put it under the tie. And I think back to that moment, I'm just like, I don't know what I was doing. I mean, obviously, you know, I was booming this interview as well. And there was a lot of experimentation going on. But just, you know, you just think back to like rookie mistakes and things that, that I did. And to just the point where it's like, okay, now it's, you know, I'm happy for that, you know, just to kind of, it, it's a pain point in my brain that, uh, you know, never do that again, or at least now I can pass it on to other people when, you know, some people ask, how do you do with the tie? Well, this is how you do it with the tie, you know, and you just pass that on, you know, so that, you uh, we want good sound recorded all over the world when possible. Right, Michael? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. What are some common problems that often maybe rookie mistakes that you see over and over again that people do? This can be sort of a twofold question. You know, there, there's production, right? And then there's their sound guys. So I'll do the production thing first. Sometimes when, you know, when locations are chosen or scouted, they're chosen based on how pretty they look or, you know, proximity to this or to that. 
And then when everyone gets there, it's like, wait a minute, you guys didn't know that this fan was right here outside this window or there's an airport next door or, or you know, we're right in a, in a direct flight path. And, you know, we have to take all of those things into consideration. So that way camera's happy and audio's happy. You know, that's something that I see. It's like, you know, try to include a sound guy on your uh, on your location scout when possible. Or even if it's not the sound guy, just a, a camera guy who's sensitive to a sound guy's needs. Everyone will be will, will be happy because, you know, I'm, I'm, I've done gigs now. I've worked with a bunch of camera guys down here where we, we learn from each other. So when they go and do the scout, they're listening for out for me as well. So it's we didn't go in that room because uh, this was there or we decided not to do this over there because there was a fridge there that we couldn't unplug or whatever. And it's, you know, so that's why this is this is the, the compromise. We're here. They don't like it visually, but they know audio wise it, it's going to help uh, help out the, the, the production. Absolutely. You know, you got the production side. And then was there something right. audio wise? Uh, audio wise, it's for me, it's it's uh, I see a lot of new guys do this. It's like they're married to to the levels right so they're, they're looking at their their levels and it's like they want to make sure that the levels reach a certain point doesn't go over a certain you know measurement and sometimes you know what like yeah that's okay but you want to hear it you know you want to listen you want to you know sometimes you know cranking it all the way up you know just to get that level isn't really what you want because you're creating more ambient you're creating more more noise and 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 so i guess the point i'm trying to make is that don't just keep your eyes just fixed on your levels and think that like that that's God. It's like, listen to the overall sound that, that you're recording. And if you're happy with it, then yeah, I mean, obviously there's a certain, you know, level that you have to maintain, but don't just think that you've got to crank it and ride it and crank it and ride it. If someone is talking very loudly and then they, they kind of come down, you know, just allow for that natural uh, 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 inclination to, to, to happen. So that way it, it sounds more natural. Now that we're all digital, right. you know, we got to be careful but you also want to, you know, you don't want to have it too low. Some people, it's so low right. that it's picking up, you know, when we, when we do turn it up, say, you know, in post, it's like all this hiss and noise floor yeah. comes up with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's to the point where it's not usable. Uh, you know, it, it's funny too. It's like when you're talking about rookie mistakes, it's like a lot of, uh, you know, first time sound guys, it's, it's like you, you start to learn, you know, like I'm sure you, you've, you know, picked up from over the years. It's like you've learned what you can get away with and you know when it's a real problem. And uh, so it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I'll see, you know, kind of, you know, new sound guys and it's like, oh, we have to stop because of this, this, this. Oh, we have to do that over because of this, this, this. And it's like, well, not really, man. Like, we're fine. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because I remember when I first started, I was that way too, you know, super anxious. Like, obviously you wanted to, you want to get it as clean as possible, but depending on where you are, the situation, the schedule, whatever, sometimes you have to keep moving to the point where unless something is absolutely completely unusable, sometimes you have to let it go. So sometimes, you know, like the shirt rustle that you may hear sometimes, by the time it gets to its final, whether it be, you know, someone playing it out loud on their speakers on a computer or on their TV at home, you're not going to hear that. A lot of those sounds get muffled and buried and they just don't translate you know like they do maybe in your headphones so you have to keep that in mind too that you know just don't feel the need to just literally paralyze a production for every little thing because that's what location sound is frankly right and, and that's what uh that's what i think we all enjoy about it is trying to overcome the challenges that come with not being in a perfect quarantined uh, pristine uh, studio you know it's like there are birds outside there the guy next door is cutting his yard uh, let's just wait for him to finish cutting his yard or let's go tell him to take a 10 minute break you know or whatever and you just kind of roll with it so i fully agree uh you know if some of our listeners were you know wanting to get into location sound recording what would you recommend they do i i guess it it, it starts with finding a place where you can listen to microphones. Everywhere is in a big city where they've got a professional audio shot where you can go in and listen. But if you do, just being able to go in and listen and, and sort of begin to train your ear for, you know, what certain mics sound like is huge. And, and then in terms of production sound, it's like, you know, whatever you can afford, start out small and whether it just be, you know, a, a Zoom if it's a Zoom H2, you know, whatever, just something to just get you going so that you can record. And, you know, if you have the opportunity to do some post stuff where you can listen to what you've recorded and then that way, you know what you're giving to an editor, that helps as well. So listen to a microphone, you know, if you can go in somewhere and listen, get on site somewhere, um, reach out to, to other sound guys that maybe, you know, like if you're a PA, but you're interested in 
becoming a sound guy, you know, talk to that sound guy. And, you know, I mean, for me, it's like I, I had a great mentor who was a camera guy, but was very, very knowledgeable with sound. And so that's kind of how I came up. So to me, it's like we all have this opportunity to kind of pass it on. So it's, you know, talk to another sound guy, you know, like don't see it as a threat. You know, for me, it's it's the more we help out, we want this discipline to kind of continue on and to be as as great as it can. And uh, the only way to do that is to to share the knowledge that we do have and to pass it on. So, you know, the more tips and tricks you can learn from a veteran or someone who's been in it, the better you are. And if you learn that stuff right away, the, the less heartache you have and, and the less failures you'll have. Now, it's important to fail a little bit because you remember those things, but, you know, if you can avoid that, you know, all the better. It's, it's tough getting started. You have some embarrassing situations sometimes. Mm-hmm. And when I started off, it was rough. I mean, <laughs> you, there was degrading situations and some people couldn't make it. They left. They just, hmm. they, you know, one guy worked with me one night and he was like, I don't know if this is for me, man. <laughs> and hmm. he left and that was it. Wow. And a, a lot of us just stuck it out. And we're, you know, a lot of them are still in the industry today. And it's almost like a trial by fire. It's like they're oh, weeding yes. out the people that, that can't, they can't take it, you know? Yes, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Particularly lo- location sound. It's like, you're just, you know, if, if you're not gonna, you know, if you're not gonna make it on set, it, you know, with, uh, you know, w- w- handling different people in different environments and different personalities, then you're just not gonna, you know, you're not gonna make it. Sometimes you gotta be a fly on the wall. And sometimes, you know, you gotta kind of, you know, you're, you're able to jump in and, and be a little more, you know, involved. And, you know, it just kind of d- depends on what you're doing. But you're right, man, it just, you know, it's not for everybody. It really is not for everybody. You know, some people need to just, you know, you, you find that niche that you have and, and you just stick with it. So. Absolutely. And as we kind of wrap things up, or do you have any final words of wisdom you can share with the audience? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll I mean, oh, first of all, I just want to thank you for, for having me on. Um, this was a really awesome opportunity and, you know, um, I enjoyed uh, it, it was it was like it's like talking shop. You know, I get to, you know, every once in a while I get to, to work on set with another sound guy and it's cool to kind of talk shop and, and go back and forth. So it was I really enjoyed talking with you. So thank you for having me, Michael. Absolutely. Um, for uh, and for everybody else, it's like you know, you know. I will say this that like, you know, we're not saving lives. Like what we do is important, but you know, we're not doctors. We're not saving lives. So take yourself seriously. Be a professional, but at the same time, just realize that whatever crazy show we're on, like it's you know, it, it's going to be fine. You know, it, it it will be fine. Don't beat yourself up if if you made a mistake on this or whatever. If you have the opportunity to correct it, do it. And that's, you know, one of the, the biggest things that I learned, you know, one of my one of the, my mentors told me once before, it's like, you know, my boss insists on bad news immediately. So <laughs> if, if there is a thing, if there's a, an issue where, you know, you're recording something and there's a problem, it's like, don't just let it go, you know, um, speak up for yourself w- w- when appropriate. And because, you know, once it's recorded, it's forever. So you don't want people to get back right. and, and, and think, well, why didn't he say something? Why, you know, he, he just sat there. Why didn't he? You don't want people to just smile and grin with you on the way out. You want them to also smile and grin when they're listening in the edit to, to what you recorded for them. So that's right. It's like it didn't go into record. Don't pretend like nothing happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So true. So great words of, of wisdom there. But, uh, you know, if a production is planning to be in South Florida, you know, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, my email address is Larry, that's L-A-R-R-Y, at lwjproductions.com. And uh, if any of you guys are on Instagram, I'm on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at LWJ Sound. Well, Larry, thanks for joining us today. And we've been talking with Larry Williams, Jr., He's a location sound mixer in South Florida. Look him up. And a big thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you'd like us to discuss a particular topic, please send us an email at locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. We would love for you to subscribe and leave us a comment. We're available on Apple Podcasts and iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.